Welcome to episode 36 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time, and Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is The Experience of Being Experienced. This episode is part two of my series on race-related matters. Don't worry if you didn't listen to the last one, as each episode is independent of the other. However, to get the fullest context, I definitely recommend watching them all. In episode 34, I discussed hearing the voice of others as a matter of listening. And for those who prefer a discussion style episode, check out episode 35, where instead of just me, I'm joined by my co-host, Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary, and we discuss the same topic. This week, I'll be discussing with Josh the experience of being experienced. And what does that mean, you ask? Well, let's dive right in and find out. Good day, Josh, how are you? Oh, buddy, I'm good, how are you doing today? Very well. And I'm going to have to make sure not to look over to the right, which is where I have the screen of you. I remember to look at the camera here. <laughs> yeah, so, me too. I, I was getting used to this. So Yeah, this whole new camera thing. And then I've got my different screens. So I have my notes and whatnot available to me. It's a little bit awkward. So I got to try to remember to, that I'm not looking that I'm looking at you when I'm looking at the camera. So it's interesting. Yeah, I had to I had to get a picture of you and put up there so I can. <laughs> that's the <DL. laughs> Right. Yeah. So. Any thoughts on this? Do you, I, I know that you checked out the show notes and all that. So curious on what your th your initial thought was. Well, initial thought, I mean, it, it, it all starts with, you know, good communication. And, uh, you know, I really liked how you uh, uh, you did that episode, uh, the book uh, Social Intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually did uh, read that a couple of years ago. And um, it, it's how successful we are when we engage someone all has to do with our mindset when we enter a conversation. Right. And, um, you know, so I, I thought it was an excellent episode. I'm looking forward to talking about it today. So Absolutely. And for anybody that didn't watch that episode, I start off by asking a simple question. You know, when we discuss politics, what is it that we can learn from a former FBI hostage negotiator and an internationally known psychologist? And so I, you know, take a moment to think about that. Um, you know, as we're, as we're going along, but, uh, you, you know, I, I have an answer and we're definitely going to get into that, but I'm kind of jumping off of the last episode where I kind of sidestepped the issue of addressing black lives matter, all lives matter. And what I said in that episode is to address the black lives matter, all lives matter issue. We need to go beyond those words. And in fact, ignore those words altogether because the root of the divide is much deeper. But again, we are kind of sidestepping that issue. So this episode, we're kind of gonna talk about it a little bit, uh, but probably in a way that you're not expecting. So hopefully you are going to find some information, uh, some, some good information out of this. So let's start with, uh, you, Josh mentioned the book, Emotional Intelligence. And I'm gonna start with a quote from that book. And now this book is uh, Social Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. He's internationally known psychologist, and his book was uh, pretty popular, and it's definitely something that I think that anybody that's listening should read to, or should read, not read to. Uh, so here's the quote. Rapport feels good, generating the harmonious glow of being simpatico, a sense of friendliness where each person feels the other's warmth, understanding, and genuineness. These mutual feelings of liking strengthen the bonds between them, no matter how temporary. And that special connection always entails three elements, mutual attention, shared positive feeling, and a well-coordinated nonverbal duet. And then as these arise in tandem, we catalyze rapport. So that's the quote. Josh, what does that say to you? Well, it's funny because whenever uh, I, I was uh, looking over the, um, the episode, it, it actually reminded me of a phrase. Oddly enough, it was a corporate phrase, but it's very applicable. Uh, be here now. Mm -hmm. And whenever you are present, whenever you are uh, giving all of your attention um, to a person that you're engaging with, uh, the meaning, the, the moment becomes a lot more meaningful, becomes mm -hmm. memorable, and it has um, 
has an impact on you. And uh, during your your episode, you had mentioned a couple uh, personal stories as you related it to, uh, uh, in my word, be here now uh, with uh, your date, the date that you went on. About oh, how yes, you were, yes. you were a, a, attentive to uh, certain things that were being said. You were you were involved in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously there was a story there too, with your mom about, you know, the repetition and like, even though right. you can have disagreements with people, um, whenever you're a, a, attentive to what they're saying and the meaning behind, particularly the meaning right. behind what it is that they're trying to say, uh, we form those, those purposeful relationships and we have those, those positive conversations. So, right. um, at, paying attention, you know, don't have, whenever you're in a conversation with somebody, don't have the the next questions lined up, ready to go. You should be focused on what it is that they're saying, right. And what it is that they're meaning. So, uh, yeah. You know, so to give everybody a little bit more background of what Josh is saying, the uh, uh, Daniel Goldman goes a little bit further and he says, shared attention is the first essential ingredient as two people attend to what the other says and does. They generate a sense of mutual interest. Uh, a joint focus that amounts to perceptual glue. Such two-way attention spurs shared feelings. One indicator of rapport is mutual empathy. Both partners experience being experienced. And then he's talking about these two stories that I pre- that I provided. Um, one of them was with my wife. Uh, it was what I like to now call our first date. It really wasn't our first date. We were just friends at the time. And she had asked, hey, would you like to go out and have dinner and then see a movie? And I was like, sure, why not? And it's funny because she wanted to see Paranormal Activity 2. And I do not like horror films because they (laughs) spook me. And it doesn't matter how much I believe or don't believe in some of the paranormal. When I'm done watching a movie, I somehow fall into this space where I apparently am believing. So we went out to dinner. We watched this movie, and then uh, she had asked me prior if I wanted to attend this wine tasting. And at first, I was like, "Nah, I don't want to attend wine tasting." Like, yeah. and I and I had a really really bad view of wine at the time. I just didn't think it tasted very. Uh, I, I didn't enjoy the. Food. Wasn't appealing. Yeah. No, it wasn't at all. Yeah. And um, so after the movie, I'm spooked, and I made a joke. I was like, "Man, I'm going to have to go and have a couple drinks before I go to bed." Now I was like, you know, this, yeah, you know, I have to have to soothe myself to sleep here. And she said, <laughs> hey, would you like to go on that wine tasting? And I was like, you know what? Yeah, sure, let's go. And so we went, it was at her friend's house and I didn't know anybody there. Yeah. And we were, we were still friends, mind you, but we laughed and giggled and snickered our way throughout the evening. And so what I was saying is that's an example of, of people being experienced, you know, both yeah. her and I, had that mutual attentiveness to each other. You know, we were engaged, we were focused on each other and we were really just experiencing each, we were experiencing each other. Yes. And then the second story is one of my mother and she, uh, her and I, when I was in my early twenties, like say about 20, maybe 21, uh, I I lived at home and she would, um, her and I would stay up late and we'd watch television and we would have these, you know, really in-depth conversations. And we would talk about religion and politics and, you know, whatever, just all kinds of stuff. And it was really, really interesting because um, we did this on a very regular basis and we didn't always agree, but we always enjoyed the conversation. We always walked away feeling better having had it than, you know, maybe not having it, right? Like yeah. we, we, we thought really, uh, we, we thought very well of those, conver- you know, of, the, of those yeah. conversations. And I had said that if you were to take these two different conversations, you might look at them, uh, to look at them in a completely separate way. You could look at one and say, hey, the, the wine tasting would prob- probably be remembered as that one time, whereas the uh, experience with my mother was more like a fond memory of. And and the point that I was trying to get at is that experiencing being experienced happens in different ways. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. The the multitude of types of human interactions we can have, they they can go from someone like it's a partner, which that uh, wine tasting good thing is now your wife. So, uh, you know, you never know what conversations or futures. 
your attention can lead to. Right. Um, and, and obviously family members, but I mean, there, even interactions on a smaller basis, like, you know, you run into somebody at the store, um, you know, movies or, or at a gas station or random stranger, each interaction we have with someone uh, mm -hmm. can have a, a, a variety of magnitude and uh, our, our attention and our participation in that uh, interaction, uh, you know, impacts it all. So we can, right. So, so uh, example, I just go here. Like I, I have interactions with hundreds of people on a daily basis with pharmacists. Now to me, each one of those interactions, I mean, sure. If I look at it globally, they, they all blend together. I had interactions with a hundred patients today, mm -hmm. you know, um, but if I flip it the other way around, how was that interacting to them? Well, that's right. the only time they'll see me that day. Everything about that interaction to them will will stick out and will be important, right. you know, right. important to them. And you got to remember that just because you view an interaction one way does not mean that is how the other person you're participating with views that interaction. Right. So it's just always it's always important to to always open that paradigm, that window a little bit. So, uh, you know, yeah, that's good. Absolutely. And so now segueing this into the topic of the day and then kind of bringing it back to, hey, what does this have to do with Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter? And I, I ask people to think about, like, think about um, the last exchange that you recall where two people were discussing the different, their differences between All Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter. And think about, did that, did that exchange in any way sound like it was leading to or was uh, an example of people being experienced? And I think, it's, I think it's rare to find when one does. And, and I think that's part of the problem with this dynamic. We, we, think that, we tend to think that the problem is, oh, they're just using this word. They need to use my word. And I'm no. saying, no, let's dig a little deeper. I think I think what's going on is we're not hearing that other person. And what tends to happen is that people walk away from the conversation with no better understanding of the other person's position or, and this is really important, or why that person feels so drawn to it. No rapport gets created and consequently, no ground is gained for the other side. And, and this even applies to people observing it. No, so, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you, go ahead. I, if, you, if you were segueing oh, into no, something no, no, else go, there. No, go, no, go right ahead. You're good. You're good. No, whenever you uh, you spend time in those those meaningful reaction uh, interactions with one another, um, you get past words and you discover meaning. Right. And, and, and that's that's something that like I, I've tried to talk about on the apothecary pages. We spend too many time, too much time focusing on labels and arguing mm -hmm. over semantics that we end right. up talking past each other with our meanings. And um, th that's a big part of the to me, from my point of view, the all lives matter, black lives matter uh, debate and discussion is you have groups of people who are talking past each other, not understanding the meaning behind right. what it is that they're doing. So, and that's, what's important to get to is what are we meaning, you know, uh, what, what are we meaning to achieve? Right. And, you know, I, I think that um, one way to think of it is we spend so much time trying to get somebody where we want them to, that we aren't really getting them maybe where they need to be or ourselves where we need to be. And so one of the things that I point out is that my mother and I, she was a diehard Christian conservative uh, until the day she passed in back in 2016. And, um, uh, you know, I was at the time in my early 20s, I'm 42 now, so this is 20 years ago. And eventually I just kind of moved my way along and found myself, uh, you know, becoming libertarian over time. And, um, but, but I, we both relished the conversation. So I was a little distracted there. My son's in the background downstairs playing with grandma. And I was like, okay, is that a noise I got to go and address? <laughs> so, so folks, bear with me. Liberty dad has Liberty Amen. son. And from time to time, he has to handle business. So right now he's not in the studio as he was last episode, uh, which is a little bit more helpful. But that doesn't mean that he is not being a little bit of a terror because he is too. So, yes. um, so if I get distracted, <laughs> please don't, you know, don't mind that. 
Uh, but the thing that I always I, I, I ended up looking for from my mother was not for her to necessarily disagree, but her, for her to say something like, OK, well, that's a fair point, because what that meant is that she was listening. She heard what I had to say, my message that I wanted to deliver to her. Um, and to me, that's the very, very first step that we need. It's like people want to skip a step. They want to mm -hmm. say, OK, I need you to agree with me now. And I'm like, yeah. really? Maybe what we need to do is say, maybe we need to back up and say, there's, there's going to be a series of conversations. And, we're, and we'll touch upon that here in a little bit. You know, in these series of conversations, you know, one after another, one leads to the other, you know, and, and that's kind of what I say in the intro is that the conversation that I have today is uh, determines the, you know, the conversation tomorrow, you know, so I'm preparing for tomorrow's conversation by how I engage today. Yes. Absolutely. And, and feel free to just jump right on in, Josh. Don't don't mind. You know, I, I know oh. we're we're both new at this. And so we're kind of yeah. working out and you know um, feeling each other out here. Well, you know, you go through and I, I really like the uh I'm kind of gonna retouch on on the uh the book uh that you you had mentioned in your episode. And I, I like the there was those six phases. Am I jumping ahead? I, I want no, to talk no, about you're good. This. No, you're good. We can jump okay. right on into it. Okay. Um, you know, the first thing um and I tried when I was going through this, I tried to think, how, how can I apply this to uh, a conversation? Let's just mm -hmm, say I was mm -hmm. going into a conversation with uh, a fellow libertarian, since we all fight with each other all the right, time. Let, right, let's right. let's. Uh, um, so the, the first step in that was uh, to prepare uh, mm -hmm. for for a conversation or for an interaction. And um, how often do we actually prepare ourselves for a topic? And I'm right. not talking just because we're sitting here doing a, a conversation or so, but mm -hmm. if we go in and like, say we're watching the news and something shows up and, uh, you know, a story, uh, it doesn't matter what it's on, just a story. Do we really prepare ourselves to talk about that with someone else? Or right. do we just go by what we said? Do we, do we look at any background? Do we do any research? Do we formulate our own opinion about it? You know, to me, that that's what goes into preparing about something is to understand it. And, right. um, and oftentimes, because of lack of preparation, uh, we right. end up going into not understanding something the way we should. And then when we're right. talking about something important, let's just say we're, uh, you know, you, you don't fully understand. And, uh, and you go in to talk to somebody about it. Um, it's really hard to have any type of authority on the subject that is, uh, whenever you right. come in and you're, you're unaware and you're unaware of the other, other individual, uh, individual's position. And, uh, right. it puts us at a disadvantage. I like that. N number one on that list was to prepare for a conversation is prepare yeah. to be ready for it. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and let's, let's dive in here real quick into these, these six items. And so what Josh is talking about is remember early on, I asked, Hey, what can we learn from a hostage negotiator? and an international psychologist. Well, we talked about the international psychologist and we talked about this idea of rapport and experience of being experienced. So then the question is like, how do we go about it? What, what, kind, of, what kind of behaviors can we engage in that will help get us there? And so what I did was I extracted from a book called Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as Your Life Depended on It. And it's a book written by Chris Voss. He is a former FBI hostage negotiator. And it seems a bit weird to say, like, all right, we're going to use hostage negotiating tactics to talk to, like, friends and family or maybe some rando on the Internet. But here, <laughs> here's what Chris says in his book. <clears throat> he says, negotiation serves two distinct vital life functions, information gathering and behavior influencing, and includes almost any interaction where each party wants something from the other side. Negotiation, as you'll learn here, is nothing more than communicating with results. And this is one of the basis, this is the basis for my show. And when I interact with people online, and I think they're a little bit taken back by it because I'm like, look, we need to communicate with results. We need to be productive. And a lot of time people mistake it and they say, oh, well, you're just trying to be nice. And I'm like, not necessarily. I have I have come out occasionally kind of harsh with people and I try not to because I don't feel that being harsh is necessarily productive. But being super nice is not always productive either. 
sometimes you do need to draw a line and you need to say, look, this is the way it is. This is my boundary, right? But before you even get there, Chris, uh, Mr. Voss has six key areas where he, um, where he is providing some opportunity to communicate with results. And so he, I, I assigned a single word to each one of these, these, I, these areas, or maybe he did. It's, it's been a minute since I read the book. Um, but we, if we chose a single word for each one of them, we get this. We get prepare, open, discover, others, slow, and smile. And so the first one that Josh was talking about was prepare, right? And mm -hmm. so what we're doing is we're going to prepare. And he said, a, and Chris Voss says, a good negotiator prepares going in to be ready for possible surprises. And so when we talk about prepare, one of the things that people don't do I, that, I, that I don't really see is they don't come in with the idea of being surprised by what somebody else might have to say. It's like, I know every, like I read what you're saying. I know everything about it. There's nothing more that you can teach me either about you, the topic or what I, uh, you know, what I believe. It's like, it's like, I know it all. And, and that's, that's the first wrong approach. You know, um, we, we have to be ready to be surprised. Like, oh, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that about you or I didn't realize it about, you know, there's some information I didn't know. All right, that's so now that we, that's paramount. Yeah, so we get so now we're 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 we're, we're kind of keeping the audience a little bit more familiar with what where we are because you mm -hmm. know you guys didn't get the notes that we got so you know. Uh, but you want to move on to the next one, or you got more to say about about being prepared? Oh no no no, that's good. I just I really I wanted to focus on that for a second. Oh, gotcha. No, that's good. And, yeah. and 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 you know honestly, it's hard because. Right now, the current debate with libertarians is about like this alt-right pop pipeline and Nazis and all this stuff. And so let's just, you know, let's sidestep whether or not any of these labels are being used accurately or not. Um, let's just assume for a moment that we've got this person here who is a Nazi, right? Like mm -hmm. let's just say they are. Yeah. Uh, rarely do people go into it thinking that they might actually be surprised by what the person has to say. And when I say rarely, uh, I think it would be fair to say never. <laughs> in those kind of conversations. I would say so. You, you know, know, it's it's like one of those things where uh, uh, <clears throat> they go into it not expecting to be surprised. They've already made up their assumptions about right. what that label means. Right. And that they've already decided that they're not going to accept anything that they say. Right. Not saying that they should. You know, I'm just saying that we're talking about whenever you're you're engaging someone in a in a meaningful conversation. Um, so yeah, right. it's I, I had a conversation. Yeah, I had a conversation with somebody just yesterday and uh, the, the man, Daryl Davis was brought up. And if you don't know who Daryl Davis is, he is, uh, he is a black jazz musician. And his story is that when he was like, I don't know, like nine or 10, he was in a parade, um, just a regular standard parade. It wasn't like a, a political parade, I don't believe. Uh, but he was in a parade and he was like one of the only black kids. And he said he got, he was starting getting, getting hit with stuff. And he said he, at the time, he never, he didn't connect that, hey, people are throwing stuff at me because I'm black. And later he found out because people approached him and apologized, you know, some of his, like some of the people that were with him, they said, hey, we're really sorry that happened to you. And so yeah. then he realized like, oh my God, people were throwing stuff at me because I'm black. And he was really confused because he said, why do people hate me when they don't know me? And this was a question that burned in his mind for a very, very long time. When he became an adult, he decided to pursue it. And so he reached out and uh, had his secretary set up a meeting, unbeknownst to this local Klan leader, that he was black, that he was, mm -hmm. was going to have a, 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 a meeting with the black man. Yeah. So he meets with the guy. And all he wants to do is find out, hey, why do you hate me when you don't know me? And the yeah. particular person that I was talking to was you know mentioning this and was kind of saying like you know because daryl davis tells everybody he said he he admonishes people to do the same thing he's like look i'm not a psychologist i'm not a sociologist if i can do it you can do it and what the it is is having a conversation that leads people to give up their their terrible ways and he's got like all this memorabilia from Nazis, uh, you know, not Nazis, I'm sorry, from the KKK, all this KKK memorabilia where people through conversation with him have ended up saying, you know what, turns out everything I thought about black people 
I realize is wrong. And they gave up their lifestyle of being in the KKK. Yeah. So he tells everybody like, if I can do it, you can do it. And so this person is like, you know, that's, they basically, it sounded like they were saying, hey, people just say that is an excuse to tolerate bad behavior, but they never challenge people on their terrible views. And then I said, I think that's the problem to begin with. We're starting off by saying, I need to challenge you. And that's not being, um, that, that's not preparing to be surprised because you're too busy thinking about, I need to challenge your ideas because I, I know everything I need to know about them. So therefore there's nothing that you can tell me yeah. that I'm going to learn from. Uh, and that's a problem because when you don't, the less you know about somebody, the less you can speak to them. It's, it's really what it ends up being. Well, it, it ties into the the second point. And I'm, I'm not trying to get ahead, but about being open. Oh, no, open. Let's, let's, no let's, you know, let's go right up. Let's move right along. Uh, about being open. Now, I, I think this is part of the, the argument that some of the libertarians were having past couple of days about, oh, I, I don't need to hear what they have to say. Right. Uh, well, here, here's the thing. And, and this is not to be confused with saying that I think that Nazism or anything has any merit to it. But if you don't go into a conversation already acknowledging the fact that there might be some merit here, there might be some some good information here. If you if you go into it already closed off, you're not going to hear what the person's saying. Right. Now, and if you're not hearing what they're saying, there's no way you could change their mind or mm-hmm. help help foster a different point of view. Right. Um, now, like, like in the case with that gentleman where he went and he met with some of these people and they got to interact with him as a human being, mm-hmm. all the labels came down. So at that point, he wasn't he was no longer a black man. He was right. just a man. Right. You know, a flesh and blood with thoughts and feelings and desires, just like anyone else. And um, that's what really is getting at, at when you boil all this down, uh, communication, and negotiating, whether it's political or personal, it has to do with getting to know and to understand your fellow human being. Right. That's what it comes down to. And if you can go into a conversation open enough to hear what it is that they're saying, hear what it is that they're feeling and why, most importantly, right. why, right. Uh, you know, you drop the labels, th- th- then you can start having, you know, success in your negotiation, whatever that may be. Right. But that's the, that's the key. You got, you, we got to be open enough to hear what other people are saying. Right. And here's what Mr. Voss says about being open, right? And this is the second point, by, mind you. So if you're watching, uh, you know, we started off with prepare. Now we've moved on to the second point. There are six of them. Um, what strategies that we can use. The second one is being open. And he says this, don't commit to assumptions. Instead, Mm -hmm. view them as a hypothesis and use the negotiation to test that hypothesis or hypotheses uh, very rigorously. And this is what Josh is saying. You know, when he says there might be merit, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, what I don't believe he's saying is that, hey, okay, this Nazi might have a good reason for being a Nazi. Like that, that seems like it would be pretty absurd. No, 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 no. But what, but what we need to be mindful of when we're being open is to realizing that our assumptions may be wrong. And those assumptions could be, uh, you know, that, we're, um, that, that, we, that we know everything we need to know about that person. And we might find that our assumptions are correct, right? We are testing this hypothesis. We might find that our, our reason for, you know, uh, opposing this particular person or this particular person who has this idea, um, it, our assumption may be correct could also be incorrect or actually okay, I, good, sorry. it could be that it's right or wrong. It's correct or incorrect for reasons that we didn't realize. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a number of different areas that we can still be learning. And that's, that's been the biggest problem that, that I see is that um, people make these assumptions and it's, it's like when you um, you know, when, when, Somebody says, uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. It, it was in that same conversation. Somebody said, uh, you know, well, what about this person over here who is a Nazi and they're friends with so-and-so? And I said, well, that's not accurate. They're not a Nazi, uh, as far as I know, because I know this person personally. And I said, they, um, uh, and they're no longer friends with this other person that you've associated with them. And on top of that, They've actually 
years ago dismissed this person and called them their enemy. So, so now I'm talking to somebody who says person A is a Nazi because they're associating with person B. And I'm like, well, person A has uh, disavowed person B years ago and even called them an enemy. That, you know, and they said, well, how are you going to, they, they, they were kind of surprised. They're like, I can't believe you're going to defend somebody. And I said, I'm not defending anybody. Yeah. I'm getting the record straight so that we can have a meaningful conversation. You cannot have a meaningful conversation if you're walking around with incorrect assumptions about someone or something. You know, if somebody is a Nazi, fine, if they are. But if they're not, then there's no reason to start making that assumption because now you're you're not really open to having your hypotheses challenged. And it's clear that you stepped into the conversation ill-prepared because you were not ready to be surprised by what you thought you knew. Well, it's much easier to be to be lazy and to just label people. Um, right. You know, you know it, to, to allow yourself to be challenged, uh, it takes a level of security for yourself. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, and, and as you're saying, I wasn't saying, uh, and I'm glad you kind of clarified it, I wasn't saying that there's merit in being a Nazi. Um, I'm just saying, if you view everybody as having potential merit of their opinions, right, you're going to go into it openly. So when right. I go in, I, and I've gone into a few conversations with people who were supposed Nazis, and I was open up and I'm halfway through the conversation, you're like, this person's not a Nazi. Right. You know, so, so, but if I would have had that label going into it, uh, I, I may have closed myself off if I was not being open, right? Uh, you, you know about the conversation, and um, yeah, right. And that, and so then this leads us to the next point, number three, which is discover. And uh, Boss says this. He says negotiation is not an act of battle. See what see what see what's happening here. We're we're tearing down the ways that we normally uh, approach conversations. So negotiation is not an act of battle. It's a process of discovery. The goal is to uncover as much information as possible. And this is what I, I said this earlier, the more information that you have, the more that you can actually speak to that person. Why are they a Nazi? So remember the movie, American History X? Did you ever see that movie? It was a fabulous yes. movie. If you, if it, you know, anybody watching, if you haven't seen it, I am um, late nineties, early two thousands. I can't remember exactly when it came out. But it's a story about a guy that's growing up in California, and he's at, at the at the start of the movie. He is coming, I believe, he's coming out of jail, and he um, and, and and you start kind of getting his backstory as it's going along of how he got involved in white supremacy. Well, it turns out if you only heard him as a white supremacist in this movie then you just think that he's just this, this hateful guy that is just uh, hateful to be hateful. Yeah. But what, uh, but what happened, what actually, when you, when you watch, when you go through the movie a little bit further, what you find out is that he's hateful because his dad was a firefighter and his dad went to fight a fire in a bad part of town and got shot by somebody who was black. Now, I, I, I don't think the story specifically goes into too much detail. Now, this, you know, and, and it's, if you're not open, if you're not willing to discover something about somebody, then you don't learn this kind of information. And when you don't learn this kind of information, you are in less of a position to actually help bring them from this terrible position that they are, yeah. right? Um, and it's an interesting movie because uh, I don't remember the name of all the actors. I think Edward uh, Furlong was in it and Edward Norton. I think those are the two mm -hmm. primary characters. And there was a uh, there was a black man, I believe, who was a principal at the school that his younger brother was going to, who visited um, Edward Norton, and I don't remember his character's name, but visited him while he was in jail for killing a black man um, and helped him reform. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a really phenomenal story because it shows that Yes, you can you can have a dialogue with somebody, even somebody who is filled with hate, and it's possible to bring them from that hate. But you have to do it in a way that allows that person to open up. And that's what this list of things kind of does. It kind of says, look, this allows that person to open up and tell you more of who they are 
so that you have this information. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. You know, I'm, I'm a very chatty guy, but I guess it's my show. It's okay. But jump in, <laughs> yeah. just, just jump right in. I tell my wife all the time, I'm like, look, just say, um, let me speak. You know, and that's kind of oh. like, that's my cue to shut up because sometimes no, I, I get so, I get so into what I'm saying. I, I try to focus on listening because I do like to talk a lot just because, right. you know, we're, we're passionate people. Right. So. But no, but what you're, what you're saying is, is right on. We have to, well, let's step back. If our intentions and, and I, your intention and my intention, I believe is pretty similar. We, we want to see liberty and society. We want to see a better society than we currently have for our children. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So, these problems that we have these whether if it's racism classism if we stick with the labels and we don't have these conversations right. and we're not willing to have these conversations there's not going to be any improvement right that's that's objective yeah. unless you're just hoping that you know these people will, will just magically change on their own or whatever mm -hmm. let's just let's just say that aside say say we stay over in our corner and we make base assumptions about other people and we make generalized labels about other people and we don't engage them in any kind of conversation eventually that moves over into the realm where we now are putting these divisions in statute right you see where i'm going with it yeah. so whenever we get to the point where we we don't even want to communicate with these people it moves over into, well, we don't even want to live in the same society as these people. Right. And that, that is how hate becomes codified. And, right. and that, that's part of what uh, the, the lady from the uh, Mandalorian got in trouble with. Um, well, she was pointing out demonizing people is not a good thing. Right. You know, and, and the first step to me to break down those, those faulty labels is to uh, actually find meaningful conversation uh, with people and to find out the reasons why. Right. And, and if we're going to have a better society, it takes heavy lifting. And sometimes that takes, you know, dropping labels and putting in the hard work and preparing and having a conversation right. with your neighbor. So, Absolutely. You know, I, I tell people all the time, I challenge them. I say, okay, if we, um, if we dismiss somebody and we push them out, uh, you know, for, for people that believe that that we should do that, that we should just like, hey, you're bad, get out. You're not welcome here anymore. How many of those people uh, that that believe that this is a good way, a good approach, how many people have you been responsible for reforming? Because you know what I see? I see stories, and I know it's fiction. I see stories like, um, like American History X, uh, but then we see it play out in real life with people like Daryl Davis, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there are other stories. There's a story from actually here in Jacksonville, and I'll get to that in a minute. But what, there's stories where when people engage with somebody and set aside their own disdain for somebody else's vile behavior, those are the stories that we hear about where somebody's life was changed. We're not hearing this. We're not, I'm not, I don't hear people say, man, I disavowed 10 friends and nine of them realized, you know, that was their wake up call and they realized they were wrong and they decided to change their ways. You don't hear those stories. We no. don't see it in our fiction. We don't see people telling their story that, Hey, this is how I did it. it be, well, because two things, one, it doesn't change anybody. And, and, uh, and two, uh, when it taken to its fullest extent, you know, those, that group of people is ostracized and made illegal throughout history. So right. that's why you don't see it in your fiction, because it's usually the tragedies that you read right. about in history. It is. Um, and the story here in Jacksonville, um, there was a, a filmmaker and I am, I cannot remember her name, but I believe it was a, um, I believe it was a Middle Eastern woman, uh, American, but she was Middle Eastern descent. And she was doing a documentary called, um, I think it's like confronting the right alt-right America or something like that. Uh, it was something like that. It was on Netflix. So I watched it and she actually met with a guy named Ken Parker. He was very, very notoriously known here in Jacksonville. He 
had been going to one of the colleges and posted a picture of himself with bare shirt in the bathroom, holding up the phone and then holding a rifle. And I, and I think if I remember correctly, he had a, a swastika on his chest. He might have had some other, you know, some, some other symbolism of, uh, that was very clearly uh, white supremacy. I, I, but I can't remember if it was a swastika or what it was. Um, created a lot of controversy here um, so, some years ago. Well, she mm -hmm. went to interview the guy and um, he was still involved in his, his white supremacy. Uh, it, he, he still had that, that same involvement. And um, it was interesting because she, it was in the video, she called him afterward because apparently his girlfriend had gotten sick. And she said, you know, hey, I just want to follow up and see how your girlfriend's doing. I know that she was put into the hospital. And he points out, I, I think she has the recording. He said, um, you're the only person that called me to ask about my girlfriend. Now, again, this guy did not like her because she was brown and was very mm -hmm. clear. He was not, you know, and he was telling his story about it. Well, later, I don't know, like a year or two later, uh, apparently here in town, a, a black preacher, and I don't know if the preacher knew who he was or not, but approached him and invited him to their barbecue, this church barbecue that they were having. Yeah. And the kid said, you know, for whatever reason, he said, sure. And so the story of this kid to kind of kind of get to the point here is that people were open with him. They were, uh, you know, they set aside uh, whatever horrible things this, this guy had done or said, and um, they engaged with him in a meaningful way. And one of the points that we should uh, that we should mention is that you know when when you're talking about discovering something because we're on point three discover by the way is that everybody wants to be heard. I can't discover something from you if I don't give you a chance to be heard, even if you're wildly wrong, right? Yeah. And these people gave him a chance to be heard, but then they they didn't treat him based on how he might treat them. They said, all right, here's the standard that I'm going to treat people and I'm going to treat you, Mr. White Supremacist, the same way, regardless. And uh, because of that, he actually ended up giving up his ways. Now, and this is the point that I'm getting at is that I keep hearing stories about how somebody engaged and mm -hmm. gave somebody a chance to be heard. Um, that doesn't mean you agree with it. That doesn't mean that you're okay with it. And that doesn't mean that you don't necessarily challenge it at some point, but you don't yeah. start there. You start with saying, let, let me hear what you have to say. Let me hear who you are. Let me get to know you. Because once you get to know somebody, then you can be an influence. So yeah. it's absolutely um, all about the approach, and especially if they're willing, you know, uh, to, to, to engage uh, the conversation and have a meaningful conversation, uh, then absolutely. Right. Uh, that that's that's what we need to do and so that leads us to the fourth point right um others right we, we, you know remember we are prepare we are um open discover and now we're on to others this is the fourth point and here's what boss says to quiet the voices in your head make your soul an all-encompassing focus the other person and what they have to say so now we're preparing ourselves to maybe learn something that we didn't know. So we're, we're ready for the conversation. And then we're going to be open to our own ideas and say, maybe I've misunderstood something. Maybe I got it right. Maybe I got it wrong. Uh, maybe yeah. one of the two for some other reason that I just didn't realize. And then we move on to, you know, being open to discover something about the, uh, the other person. Mm -hmm. And now it's okay. Now we're going to think about the other person and, you know, uh, we want to quiet the voices in our own head. And I, I liken it to this shirt where it says, I have ADD. I'm not listening. I'm waiting for my turn to speak. <laughs> and, um, you know, unfortunately too many of us do that. We're, we're waiting for our turn to speak. And, uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the, the American novelist Truman Capote? Oh yeah. He, uh, had a great, um, conversational memory, right? You know, he did. He 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 he, uh, said, he said it was ninety percent recall. Yeah, like he he would impressive. claim that he could recall conversations at a level of ninety percent. And yeah. I don't know whether or not he could recall conversations at that level. That seems pretty high. But I know that he was known for having a great memory of conversations with people. And the reason is because people said that when he was engaging with others, his focus was like solely on them. 
like he had laser he, fo he had laser right. focus right yeah. so even if it wasn't 90 percent, it was it was most certainly really high probably much higher than most of us uh, yeah. have and that was because he was focused on what they were saying not what he wanted to say and that's incredibly hard ask my wife she'll tell you that i'm i'm <laughs> terrible about being focused on other people uh, yeah me um, too. <laughs> but it, but it's something that i recognize and it is something that i i'm working to get better at so let's move on. Let's get going because we're, you know, we're, we're we, we want to try to stay within our one hour time slot here. Uh, we'll probably go a little bit over, but that's okay because I think I think this is a good conversation. The next one is slow, and here's what Foss says: slow it down. If we're too much in a hurry, people can feel as if they're not being heard, and you risk undermining the rapport and trust that you've built. You can't go too fast. You know, and this is what I was mentioning with that conversation about challenging people. I'm like, you're jumping ahead. You know, it might take multiple conversations before somebody gets to the point where they're willing to accept that some idea that they hold is wrong. Yeah. If we rush the first conversation or some other conversation between, uh, you know, before that final conversation, whatever number it might be, we may not get there because we may turn off, we may sour that person, you know, and so we need to slow it down and say, look, I realize that. I'm probably not going to change your mind today, maybe not even tomorrow, um, but it's okay. And, and Daryl Davis, going back to him, you know, one of the things that I pointed out to somebody yesterday was he started out just wanting to know why, like, why do you hate me? And it eventually developed in more conversation and more conversation. They eventually became friends. They started going to each other's events. So Daryl would go to his clan rallies and this clan leader, and it wasn't just like a regular member. He was a leader. He was a leader. And he came, he would go to, uh, he would, they would go to each other's houses to eat dinner. And he would also go to uh, watch his new friend now play jazz music at the, uh, at the jazz club or, you know, wherever, whatever club that he was playing at, you know, cool. and this all happened before the man gave up his robe. Right. And so Daryl, basically, he took it slow. He just said, I, I'm not going to rush this. I'm not going to try to get to the point where you give up your, your terrible ways. I'm going to um, just allow this to be a little bit more organic, like we would with anybody. Well, reality, with anybody, their reality, it's, it's formed slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes, it takes time. Like if, if someone has a perception that uh, another human being in this case, you know, that it was a clan member, so that they had negative views of, of, of black individuals. That doesn't just come down overnight. So that, right. that takes, you know, conversation. And this man, obviously, he 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 uh, he introduced himself. He showed that he's just another human being, another person. Right. Um, and, and I do just want I, I want to say just because of how we've been talking about this engaging conversations. Obviously, there comes a point in time where if someone is acting upon outwardly, physically, maliciously hurting people. Um, right. There's that's not a time for conversation. Let me just let me just be clear. I'm not going to try oh, to negotiate someone who's actively engaging in violence. I'm not going to try to uh, correct rationalize with them at that point in time. There's no merit in that. I just want to be clear about everything I've said. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> but we, we have to get to the point where we can we can have these these good conversations and mm -hmm. and slow down. Like like you said, we got we got to slow down. Make sure we understand what each other's meaning. We're not talking past each other, mm -hmm. and um, and try to be more like Capote, where we 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 are listening to what each other is saying, and right? Actually taking it in. So, yeah. Um, and and, yeah. and and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that caveat that you mentioned in just a moment. Let's let's finish up with this last one, number six, which is smile. And this may be the hardest one. It depends. Uh, I think if you can get through the other five then by the time you get to this one, you should actually be pretty prepared to do this. And it's a smile, put a smile on your face. And this is, this is what Foss says, put a smile on your face. When people are in a positive frame of mind, they think more quickly and are more likely to collaborate and problem solve, problem solve instead of fight and resist. Uh, and if you think about it, the likely is that you've never had a really good experience where collaboration was just, at the top of its game with somebody who was angry, you know? No. Um, and, and I asked people, I said, you know, think about somebody that's influenced you the most. How do you perceive their personality? You know, you, you probably perceive their personality is, is pretty awesome, you know, is pretty pleasant. 
Uh, there's always exceptions. I mean, there are people that maybe we've learned from who are jerks, but those aren't people that we really relish. We relish no. the people that we have a good experience with, you know? Um, and so, yeah. you know, let's recap real quick. Those are the six things that you're going to want to do when you want to try to have a conversation with somebody. Now, this is, this is when we're talking about starting out. This is, hey, I've just met this person. Maybe they're a terrible person. Maybe they have terrible ideas, both, whatever the case may be. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prepare myself to be surprised by something that I didn't know about this person. And then I'm going to be open to having my assumptions challenged because maybe my assumptions are wrong or maybe they're correct. And then I'm going to be looking to discover something, right? Now that I've been prepared, now that I'm open, I'm looking to discover, okay, what is it about this person that I don't know? Because I should expect to discover something that I don't know. And then after, uh, after we discover, we want to consider that we're, we're, we're focusing on others. It's other people. So I, when I'm engaged with Josh, I want to try to focus on what Josh is saying, not what I want to say, um, you, you know, um, or what I want to retort with. And then we want to slow it down. Remember, this is not a, this is not a race. You know, people don't change overnight. So there's no reason to rush it. When you rush it, you soil uh, a lot of the work that you've put in, if you've been putting in work, um, or you prevent yourself from being able to put in the work that's necessary. And then you want to smile. You want to make sure that you're pleasant because people want to be, they want to interact with somebody that's genuine, even a hateful person. You know, like when I, I've talked to hateful people and when I talk to them in a way that's pleasant, they enjoy it. And it gives me more opportunity to speak to them because yeah. they don't, just because they're being hateful doesn't mean that they want me to be hateful. Like it's contradictory, but again, we're talking about what we can do Yes. Um, you know, to, to experience other people. Now let's get to that caveat real quick, because I think it's a really good point And we do need to, we do need to discuss it. There is a time when you say, look, unacceptable. And I have told people before, draw your boundary and say, look, if you're going to be um, hateful toward me, I'm not going to engage. You know, so if I get online, somebody's like, DL, you're just an idiot, you're a moron, and um, you, you, you know, you, you're, you're a racist because you talk to a racist or whatever the case may be. If they're saying all these mean things, I'm like, okay, clearly you are not ready for me to engage with you. And there's nothing about that list that can change that. So I've got to at least have that person to say, okay, I'm going to engage with you in, um, in, in a less volatile way. And until that person is ready to engage in a less volatile way, I can't necessarily go through uh, that list. I can't, I can't necessarily be open because they're not actually saying anything. Now, that's different than if they're saying something in at least a way where we can have a dialogue, even yeah. if what they're saying is hateful. So they might say, well, um, so, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm like 20% Native American, right? So let's just say that somebody's got some really bad views about Native Americans, right? And they're really saying some foul things. So if they're like, oh, all you Native Americans are morons and DL, you're a moron because you're a Native American. Okay, there's no conversation to be had there. But if they come to me and they say, you know, I really have a problem with Native Americans because everyone that I've ever met has treated me like this. And so uh, I don't like Native Americans because of, I've had bad experiences. Well, I can work with that. Right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. something I can work with. Um, I can work with them telling me in, in, in a calm respectful manner to me about their terrible ideas. But if mm -hmm. you're not going to be respectful to me, to the conversation that we are trying to have, then no, yeah. I can't work with that. No. And, and, and that's why I say draw the boundary. Yeah, there does have to be boundaries, you know, and you and I both have tried to engage people on different things. And you get to the point where when it, when it starts out uh, and they're obviously not open, uh, name calling and presumptions, uh, you know, it's, it's not productive. And, you know, sometimes you do have to, to, to walk away and maybe try again at another time. Um, some ideas, like, like you said, it takes, it takes a lot of time. Uh, just mm -hmm. for me, uh, becoming a libertarian, it probably took seven or eight years <laughs> fully right. for me to fully, you know, so like, even though now that I look at it, I'm like, oh yeah, it was a good idea. And it seems obvious at the time, uh, patience, is mm -hmm. important. And, and it's something I, I, I mentioned on, uh, on, on my page the other day. I, I don't think 
we and I'm not trying to to make this overly religious here. No, no, it's okay. I mean, we, uh, but of... you know, forgiveness is an element uh, from Christ that we don't really talk about as much as I think we should. We, right. we get we get so, and this includes self forgiveness uh, for whatever, and it, whether if it's religious or not, just maybe if it's a matter of principle. But the mm-hmm. concept of forgiveness is extremely powerful and liberating. Right. You know, we, we can look at someone, we have a conversation like, okay, this person had hateful thoughts, hateful mm-hmm. ideas. Let's boil it down and let's get to it. Is this something we can move past? Right. You know, as a society, I, I think we would be much, much better served if we would focus on openness and forgiveness right. more so other than, you know, vindication and retribution. Right. Just, you know, and I, I try to approach it that way. I'm like, look, I'm not a perfect person. I have messed up a lot in my life. Have I, you know, I'm really glad social media wasn't around when I was a teenager. Right. right. I'm I'm really, I'm not saying I was, I was, I was bad. I mean, uh, you you know what I'm saying? I I mean, I I think I I, I live pretty good. I wasn't, Mm -hmm. you know, overly too much of a, but who knows? But with that being said, there's going to be mistakes and, we're all going to make mistakes and giving each other a little bit of forgiveness and understanding and talking through things to me is what helps foster a better society. Right. I'm separating government from society. Government is just a, a a product of our society, right? Society itself of how we, how we treat each other, how we engage with each other. It's a whole lot of, whole lot of push for people. Like I want to be right. I want to be vindicated. I want to be, how about let's focus a little on forgiveness. Yeah, I agree. You know, and uh, it's, it's, it's actually something that I, I, I really try to approach not only with my son, but with people in general. So I'll, I'll give everybody an example here. I had a conversation. I'm not going to use names because this show is not to, to call people out. That's not what I'm doing here. Um, but, I, but I will point out this, this, this brief conversation that I had with somebody where uh, what I had done, there's some drama going on in the Libertarian Party right now. And I said, you know what? I'm done with all this drama. What I, uh, here is my new boundary if you want to present me with some information about what so-and-so has done, uh, what I first want to see is that you reached out to them first. And if you don't reach out to them, then I assume that all you're looking for is just to be uh, vindictive or tear people down. And you're not really look to edify the community or the individual or, or anyone for that matter. You're just, yeah. you're just out to tear people down. And so I got some pushback from that. And, um, uh, and, and it was pushback that I was expecting. And one person kind of suggested like, hey, you, you know, you just, you're, you're making an excuse to, to, to talk to Nazis. Like Nazi is the, the, the buzzword right now. It's, yeah, it it's, is. It's, I, you know, I've never actually met buzzword. one. Yeah, I know. Right. I, I've never um, met one. No, I, I, I don't. Yeah. I, most people have it. <laughs> like, like very, very few people have actually met a real Nazi or a real white supremacist. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, I, so. Um, and they sure as heck wouldn't talk to one in the way they talk to him online. But that's an entirely different conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so this person accused me of something. He said, they said, uh, you know, nobody needs to reach out to Nazis before exposing them for what they are. Proposing that it's a prerequisite is BS. And you're suspect now. OK, so now it's like kind of this like very subtle like accusation. Yeah. And so what I mean is I say when I say like, hey, we draw a boundary and we say like, look, this is not going to work for me. Uh, You know, what I said was like, I have full confidence that the content of my character, the quality of my judgment and my record interacting with a wide variety of people will withstand such intellectually lazy judgment. Now, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't attack this person. I didn't say, hey, you're a moron, you're an idiot. I just said, look, what you're doing right now is intellectually lazy judgment. Like, you know, maybe the person, you know, is having a bad day. Maybe they just get a little caught up in the emotion. That's fine. They responded back that basically was saying, hey, you know, good for you, but breaking bread with neo-Nazis doesn't make you admirable. It makes you a collaborator. Now, at this point, I said nothing more. And I did it on purpose because there was nothing more for me to say. I said what I needed to say right now. Talking about forgiveness, let's bring that back to what you you were talking about. If in the future, this same person wanted to engage with me, I will treat that interaction distinct from this re- most recent one. And I will say, how are you engaging with me right now? Maybe in the past, we didn't have such, you know, uh, such a good interaction. Okay, that's fine. It happens. Um, and it's the same way with my son. You know, when my son is two, 
and he gets frustrated and throws a big fit or whatever. And so I'll take him and I'll put him in his little timeout chair. Um, or sometimes if he's throwing a really big fit, uh, because we have a lot of tile floor, I don't want him to throw a fit and, you know, bust his little baby head uh, on the tile floor. So I'll take him into his playroom, which is carpeted, and I'll sit him in there. And then I'll, and I tell him, I say, when you're ready, come back out and join us. Right. And, and, and that's the attitude I think that we need to have. It's very similar to forgiveness is, hey, okay, right now, it's not working out so well. When you're ready, you come back, we'll start over. And it's, yeah. it, and, you know, so you can call it forgiveness, you can call it whatever you want, but it's, it's basically the same, same thing is, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're giving somebody an opportunity to, to, uh, you're giving somebody a future opportunity. You're not cutting off the future opportunity because of what they did today. And in most cases, people should be able to do that. You know, I'm sure somebody will want to go, well, what if somebody like killed your dog or something like that? Uh, okay. You know, well, everybody's going to take it to the extreme yeah. on things. It's in like, an extreme situation. Like, yeah. Maybe I'm not going to ask that much from you, but we're talking about engaging yeah. with people online yeah. that have terrible ideas. People really like to go to the extremes or the fringes to pull their examples. Oh, you yeah, know, it's crazy. most of society's not out there. We're here in the middle. Right. Uh, and I'm not talking politically. I'm talking like just most people are not fringe. They're not going to, you know, so we're, we're talking usually about a, a disagreement or right. something that was said in the past. It, we're not talking about murder and rape. And right. those, obviously those, those things, yeah. are, you know, I mean, and what's sad is I have to say, obviously, uh, that unfortunately there's people who think that normal people like ourselves would somehow rationalize murder as being okay. I mean, that's kind of the impression I was getting from some of those folks the other day on the, right. In that conversation is like, well, they, no, yeah, they, they take it to an extreme and it's, you know, you don't have to be vile back. In fact, I think you absolutely should not. And there are times where I do want to just kind of, you know, fire back and just be like, you know what, I'm going to say this one really sharp thing. And I have to right. refrain from it. Cause I'm like, that, that's not productive. That's not who I want to be. And, and it's hard sometimes because people do say some mean things in the name of preventing other people from being mean or saying mean things. Yeah. So it's pretty wild, you know, but I want to make sure that I always give somebody the opportunity to come back and start fresh. And so, yeah, you're right. Sometimes we cut the conversation off and we say, look, I've tried to work with you. You're not working with me. Come back when you're ready. And, and I, and I'm, and I'm a holy, you know, you don't, you know, we do have to have boundaries. Um, but the first thing before you can have a boundary, you've got to say, I'm going to give it a valiant attempt. Yeah. I'm going to do my best to work with you. Now, if you're not ready to work with somebody, disengage altogether. Don't even start, you know, too many people are like, well, I got to get in there and say something, but they're not prepared to actually try and work with the person. Well, if you're not prepared to work with the person, maybe maybe the conversation's not for you for now. I like um, to look at it for, from my own personal view. I look at, it, you can put up boundaries, but not walls. Right. And, and, and there's a little different, like a boundary implies that there, there there's give, there's some give. Yes. Like, and if I can go into a conversation uh, with the mental mindset that I can, there's a little bit of give here. I'm gonna listen mm -hmm. to what they're saying and we're going to engage that can lead to productivity. But if you, you, you go into a conversation with just a wall, right? Uh, there's no negotiation there. There's no communication. Right. There's so, no ground to be gained. No, there's no know? ground to be gained. So, and, and, and what's the point of any of this? Right. Are, are, are we trying to impose our, our will on others or are we trying to form a, some sort of community? Right. And, and even imposing your will has, uh, you know, a, a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. So my will yeah. is that, people would um, not be jerks. I yeah. can't be a jerk to try to impose. If I impose my will in a very negative way, I'm not going to get that will. So I need to go go back and say, okay, how is it that if I if my will is that nobody be a jerk, how, how can I get that to happen? Well, that means I may have to to sacrifice some of the more um, retaliatory ways that I would prefer to do that maybe make, might make me feel good in the moment. I might yeah. have to sacrifice those for actually being productive and getting my goal. Mm -hmm. So, all right, folks, all right. I hope you enjoyed this. The next time somebody asserts something that you vehemently oppose, I want you to recall these lessons. I want you mm -hmm. to change your approach from telling to learning. It doesn't mean that you won't make any assertions of your own because it's not a game of 20 questions. The goal is to ensure that other people feel experienced. And it isn't about being nice. In fact, 
as I said, I think it's not about being nice at all, but rather about being productive. Or as Mr. Voss says in his book, communication with results. Hope you found this topic insightful, but for now it is time for a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. The goal of the bill review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I am not a lawyer, this is not a legal interpretation. And I may be wrong, as may Josh. Mm -hmm. Bills range from a page or two up to thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is a little bit on the shorter side and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. Continuing with the theme of Black History Month, we are going to focus today on the bill, or in this episode, on the bill related to the Black community, um, as we've been doing. And this episode, we're going to talk about uh, another executive order from President Biden. It's number 13985. You can look it up. And it is titled Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities Through the Federal Government. Whew. That is a lengthy title. All mm -hmm. right. So, Josh, I know Josh had some things that he wanted to say. So let's dive right in. What do you got, Josh? Um, well, you know, as, as you you laid out, I, I don't know if you were going to cover all this about the, the purpose, action and the measure of successes. Um, well, <clears throat> once again, we have a, a, a bill that or a, a executive order that seems to that wants to address the inequity uh, in the pandemic response. And um, once again, that this is another, I don't know, do you want to read the the whole thing or do you want, do you just have it posted up? Well, there? I, um, I, so I've got it. It's two pages. I don't know if we are, I'm sorry, it's four pages. And we're probably not going to want to read the whole thing because okay. then people will be tuned out and bored. But let's, let's do this. Let's read the purpose. You mentioned purpose, action, and the uh, the measure of success. So we, we'll focus, we'll try to focus on those items and then see okay. where the conversation goes. So the purpose here, uh, where are you here? Do, 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 do. Uh, lost it here. I've, I've lost my purpose. Uh, let me look at my notes here on uh, up on the screen here. Um, okay, under section one titled pol policy, it says that the purpose is, it is quoting, it is therefore the policy of my administration that the federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely affected by persistent poverty and inequality. And just so that I, because I think it's always a good idea to be on the same page of what we're either agreeing with or disagreeing with, uh, the executive order does define equity, which I know that Josh is getting ready to talk about. So here in section two, it says that equity means quote, the consistent and system, systematic, fair, just, and impartial treatment of all individuals. It then goes on to say the following, um, and this is all one sentence, by the way, so I, I'm, not, I'm not just jumping around in the bill here. It goes on to say, including individuals who belong to underserved communities that have been denied such treatment, such as Black, Latino, and Indigenous and Native American persons, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, members of religious minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ plus persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. Okay, so it's a little bit lengthy, but effectively when they say equity, they just mean the consistent and systematic, systematic fair, just and impartial treatment of all individuals, and then goes on to include a specific group of people. Josh, what do you got? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, I really don't even know where to begin on this, but I, I, I'm going to go for it. Um, you, when we discussed the bill review last week, you talked about um, what is something's purpose? Is it defined? What is the action it's going to take? And what is the measurement of success? Mm -hmm. Well, once again, this this executive order is more of a fact finding. Okay. you know, type type issue. It doesn't actually address or point out something, some evidence that uh, generated the need for this executive order. It's like saying, I, I want to go out and I want to, uh, I want to research this uh, because here's a projected problem that we think that we have. There's not any proof that this is actually taking place. Um, but 
<clears throat> now we've created, uh, I'm not sure how this will be paid for. Uh, I, I didn't actually see that, but I, I know that it's going to, uh, has a couple endpoints that it's looking for. And I believe the timetable was at six months. Uh, um, six, yes. six months. Um, well, there's two different timetables in um, two, six months and there was a year. Of, what was the other one? Yes. Um, yes. So the, the time frame is going to be that within um, six months, the uh, let's see here, looking at my notes here, I got a uh, caught me off guard on the six months. Oh, no there. problem. No problem. I'll, I'll keep uh, I'll, what, what I think we need to do, though, is both of these executive orders that we've covered now, mm -hmm. uh, whenever it comes up for those uh, the intervals are over and they're reporting them, I, I, I would like to do a follow up. OK. On, on as to what Top it is players. that they've done, um, because my, you and I talked about like, to be clear, I want there to be equal access for healthcare for all individuals. I, I, there right. shouldn't be standards uh, as, as to where we we give more to, to one group over another for anything. It, we're, we're Americans, we're human beings, policy, should be viewed as such. That's right. That's that's equal. That's gotcha. equality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that being said, because when you attack an executive order or something like this, people think, "Oh, well, you're you're saying that you don't agree with those things." No, I actually I want equality, and this actually is pushing the opposite of equality. I don't like the transition and the blending of the words equality and equity. I see it happening all the time. And I've seen it happen recently, probably the past couple of years. Uh, they're doing it from the, those are two different things. And I know that they even defined equity in, in that, that it's a consistent and systematic mm -hmm. fair. No, hold on, pause. Equality doesn't mean fair. Equity and fair, fair is a subjective word. What is okay. fair? What is fair? When you're talking about the eyes of the law. Does fair mean equal? Like if I have a dollar and I give you 50 cents, is that fair? Now that might be fair between you and me, but since fair is subjective, we bring all these other things into it. We talk about their, their mentioned systemic uh, mistreatment. Well, we have all these things that you're talking about. Um, uh, what's the, uh, what's whenever you back pay or something, um, Gosh, oh, reparations, uh, reparations. Well, from my point, that's not fair because that's something that happened in the past. It didn't involve individuals now. And to extract from one individual to give to another is equally as unjust as it was back then. Right. However, people will associate the word fair with that. And in this case of this definition with equity, mm -hmm. fair is included and it's subjective. That's not equality. Right. And I, 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 each time I see that, each time I see them putting that in bills, I need to point that out. Equity is not equality. It probably is just the opposite with how they're using it. Um, and in their definition, and, and, and this puts me at an odd situation, their definition of uh, this uh, equity and these, these, all these marginalized groups, it would have been much easier if they would have said everybody but Caucasian Christians. Mm -hmm. And that's not like I, I, I advise everybody to go look at it. That's not a conspiracy theory. That's not me saying that as a Caucasian Christian. That's the only group missing is Caucasian Christians. And to me, that's just we have got to get past the point of cutting ourselves up into groups right? and, and looking at ourselves, because all that does is once again, like imagine if you have someone who is radical who does right. subscribe to those things we were talking about before. Right. How is that going to make them feel? How are they going to interpret that? Now, obviously me, like I, I don't, I just see it as another way that the state's cutting us up. But gotcha. if somebody uh, has strong racial feelings one way or mm -hmm. another, this is the kind of stuff that fosters radicalism. And to me, the executive order, I mean, it, it's just, it's more division. Mm -hmm. It's a fact finding uh, and then they even, they, they mentioned too, they talked about poverty, Look, poverty is a subjective thing as well. Um, having traveled all over the world, uh, people don't realize our level, our standard of living here, how much higher it truly is. And I, gotcha. you know, you know, 
equity, like I want equal opportunity for people. I want equal opportunity for healthcare. We do have a lot of problems in our healthcare industry that needs to be remedied. But to me, that this executive order is just another virtue signal uh, that's going to end up causing more division in the long run. It's not going to cause any meaningful, and to me, meaningful in healthcare is improving outcomes of. So right. am I improving the, the healthcare outcomes of people inside the system uh, mm-hmm. as it relates to disparities and these types of things? Um, th- those are the objective endpoints. You start cutting them up beyond that into communities, uh, lot, lots of problems. So, so that's, gotcha. that's my take on it. I, I, you know, I, I don't like this executive order and I would like to, I think it's important executive orders like this, just like the one we talked about last week, I'm concerned about what they're creating like mm-hmm. last week's executive order, there was a centralized database that it's right. creating. And, and this is the same type of thing, you know, a lot of violations of HIPAA that's going to take place in this. And, um, you know, th- okay. th- this is a, this is a slow move to a central uh, healthcare. Gotcha. So let's, um, so I like to be as open and as honest as possible here before the show, Josh asked, he said, Hey, you know, mind if, do you mind if I go here with this? And I said, no, not at all. And I told him that I might push back a little bit and I'm going to, but, um, cause I want I want to see kind of, uh, where we can get with this conversation. So Josh, you were saying that, um, you felt that it would be a little bit easier. It would probably be short, a fewer words just to say who they're, who's not included to say, Hey, look, um, Caucasian Christian people are excluded, but if you're not one of those, then you're probably included. And yeah. so <clears throat> the title of the bill, and sometimes you can you can tell a lot by the title of the bill. The title of the bill, which was a bit long in my opinion, does mm-hmm. end with um, underserved communities through the federal government. So my question to you is, um, is it the case that the uh, Caucasian Christian community has been underserved by the federal government? And if so, how? Because I think that's where, I think that's where it may be a bit challenging for someone to say, okay, I get your point on not including them because it does say underserved communities. So we're, we're talking very, very specifically about particular communities, not necessarily who they are per se, but how they've been treated by the federal government. Well, um, if, if we're gonna go down that route, and if the question then, if we isolate it down, has Caucasian Christian communities been underserved? Honestly, you're going to find, uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, there's not probably been any other community that's been more underserved uh, in the past 50 years, most likely. And I, I'm separating race out of this for a second. Uh, let, let's just talk about communities, period. Okay. Um, the Rust Belt. Appalachia. That's where I'm from. I had friends with dirt floors. Okay. Okay. I've even seen in Appalachia, and I know that they mentioned uh, uh, poverty in the in the EO, but the um, the way they define poverty doesn't hit most of these Rust Belt communities. Okay. When you live in urban centers, you have a lot of uh, programs, uh, housing programs, mm-hmm. uh, assistance programs. When you live in rural Appalachia. Yeah, you do not. Um, You know, people still die from, and I know they do this in in, in inner cities too. I'm not saying poverty is bad everywhere it is, but you know, when you still have people that are dying during winter uh, for for not having heat, Mm -hmm. uh, you you know, when you have people that are getting third world type infections, you know, in the heart of Kentucky, because, you know, they don't have uh, floors, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard for me to look at a, an executive order that completely dismisses a huge segment and maybe not mathematically number wise, but geographic segment of the population is just being, Oh, you're, you're fine. Right. Um, because I witnessed that all growing up, all, you know, the distribution of funds uh, for school systems would typically go to the more endowed schools right. or your impoverished schools. They wouldn't get very much. Now, we see this throughout the spectrum, regardless of race. So instead of making it a a race or class issue, we need to. I, I would be okay if we serve, if this executive order focused on wealth inequality, and not okay. that I not that I want to, you know, redistribute the wealth, but in our system, whether if it's uh, healthcare, uh, education, there are significant wealth gaps 
that causes breaks in access to care and breaks right. in quality of education. So when we, we focus it down on just these disenfranchised communities, well, if you actually want to look at the number of it, the poverty line for uh, a lot of these supposed disenfranchised communities, the financial line is significantly higher than Appalachia, but yet mm -hmm. they're disregarded. So instead of, but the problem is if we focus on the wealth disparity and more particularly, we talk about coming from the federal government, how is the federal government not serving it? I, it's not that I want the federal government to uh, be more involved. I actually want them to be less involved, but the way that they distribute funds right now it's not mm -hmm. equal. Okay. It is not it is not based upon uh, these. A lot of times it's like this representative's district gets X amount of dollars extra because, you know, they have a lobbying firm or blah, blah, blah. Some some other political gamesmanship. If we really wanted to attack equality in the system, we would we would follow the dollars and we wouldn't be following, you know, skin color and things like that. So I, I think it's, it's the whole executive order is disingenuous. Okay. Honestly. So would you, would you be, would you have less problem with this executive order if it had included um, Caucasian Christians in that list? I would have less problem with the order. If it didn't break people down, it would just say, we're going to look at uh, inequality in the, in the distribution of federal programs. Okay, so then my my question to, to to push a little bit here is, does it matter that it didn't? If, if that's the case, if you'd rather it not identify all these different particular groups, does it really matter that it didn't include one, regardless of whether or not it's you know the, the oh yeah yeah it does to me because uh, I'm thinking of all the all the people I know back home uh, mm -hmm. who uh, this executive order is not going to benefit, and they would actually need something like this to benefit them. Right. Um, they're, I, they're I guess getting... what I'm, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I guess what I'm trying to, uh, what I'm getting at and what's uh, a little bit confusing here if, for me is that um, on one hand, I'm, what I'm hearing you say is that, hey, this, uh, this executive order, it's, it's skipping out this particular group. But on the other hand, this, uh, I, I would rather them not identify any of the groups. And so it seems to create a conflict in my mind here saying, okay, I don't like that you've missed this group, but I don't think you should have actually included any group. So then I kind of wonder if the first is really all that relevant. Maybe it should be, hey, you know what? We're focusing too much on groups and it doesn't really, really matter which groups are in there. Uh, the, the focus on the groups is problematic in itself, not who actually got to be included and who didn't. And I'm going to step uh, out of the, I'm going to, I'm listening. I'm going to step out of you. My, uh, I got to replug in my laptop here. So give me just a moment as I step to the side. Okay. Oh, I, I'll explain. You said that there, there, there's two parts there. Do I have um, one? Is there an issue with just the group um, being excluded versus um, not including them at all? Uh, it's, it's two things that for the purpose of the, the, the executive order, mm -hmm. from what I gather, from what they're trying to do, Right. It shouldn't be broken down into any groups. So that does okay. get rid of my initial complaint. My initial complaint bringing it back is doing that, leaving it as is, causes more problems. Right. So if, if we're just focusing on the executive order itself to fulfill its purpose, mm -hmm. it should have just stayed, you know, groupless, not, not dividing everybody gotcha. up. Uh, so, but, so then but it might have read, oh, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. But by the manner that, of their delivery, mm -hmm. I believe, my, this, is, this is my opinion, this is what really stuck out to me, is they're, it's, it's trying to foster division. Okay. Um, you're, you're, and, and not to mention, too, it's underserving part of the community that they need to be serving. Right. Equally. Um, so primarily, my issue is it shouldn't be divided up. Gotcha. Uh, so, so then, so, really, I, even, even, so they really don't contra contradict each other. It's just okay. how is the EO being applied? Gotcha. So it might have been better if it was written like this. And I'm going to change. I'm going to re, I'm going to slightly reword it in three different areas here. So if the title, instead of saying advancing racial equity, just said advancing equity and support for communities through the federal government rather than underserved. So we're, we're just saying look for communities in general. And then in under policy in section one, it might have read, it is therefore the policy of my administration 
that the federal government should pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all and leaving it there. And then down under the definition, when it says the term equity means the consistent and systematic, fair, just, and impartial treatment of all individuals, period, end of story. Now we're not even going into including this group and that group, just saying, look, yeah. if you're an individual, if you're a group, um, we're going to make sure that you, uh, that, um, that you, Josh, are getting the same equity uh, from through federal government as is this person over here, regardless of what demographic they belong to. Correct. I, 100%. Okay. I, I would so, so that would have been that. a better start for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so now let's uh, let's go back. Let's circle back a little bit because I did find the uh, the timelines here. So one of the timelines. Uh, so I think we've resolved it. Did we? Re did, is there anything that we need to still cover there? I, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Good. So so we've moved on, saying, hey, look, the problem with this bill is that it identifies some groups at the exclusion of others. And if what I hear you saying, Josh, is uh, I have a problem with that. Be, uh, you, speaking for you here, uh, yeah, yeah. you're saying I have a problem with that because I think it's going to foster some resentment, some some uh, some issues because this group gets singled out positively and this group gets excluded. Uh, they're not even included. Included, and it doesn't matter what group it is. You happen to be particularly talking about Christian, um, uh, 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 Caucasian Christians, but it could be any other group. I, it, it wouldn't matter if, if what group it was gotcha. that was singled out. I just had personal experience with the Caucasian Christians, gotcha. obviously, and where I grew up. But uh, any group that would have been excluded, because I, I don't, I don't, especially as a healthcare provider, I don't view people in groups. You are individuals, right. and I don't like gotcha. looking at policy that cuts us up as such. Gotcha. Okay, so the uh, uh, within six months of the date of this order, the director of the OMB actually, you know what? Let me back up just a wee bit here. Um, and it says that the uh, the director of the uh, this is un under identifying methods to assess equity. Okay, so this is kind of where we're talking about. Hey, what are you going to do here exactly, right? Because we still yeah, haven't yeah. really talked about what does this order do. And um, so the director of the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, shall in partnership with the heads of agencies study methods for assessing whether agency policies and actions create or exacerbate barriers to full and equal participation by all eligible individuals. So now what we're saying is like, hey, the director, uh, the OMB, uh, with all these different agencies, the heads of them, you guys are going to study and determine whether or not you have policies um, or actions that create problems or make problem, existing problems worse that prevent people from getting the full uh, access and equal participation uh, for anybody that's eligible, right? In, 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 in whichever whichever department we're talking about, because not everybody necessarily is eligible for something, you know, yes. maybe you make too much money, you're not eligible for this, whatever. And that's an entirely different conversation. Um, and so then it says, within six months of the date of this order, the director of the OMB shall deliver a report to the president describing the best practices identified by the study and as appropriate, recommending approaches to expand the use of these methods across the federal government. Uh, so that's the first timeline. The second timeline says, within one year of the date of this order, the head of each agency shall consult with the, uh, um, with, with the AD, A, APDP. Um, I'm, not sure what they, I'm not sure what that stands for at the moment. Um, and the director of the OMB to produce a plan for addressing any barriers to full and equal participation um, and any barriers in full and equal participation in agency procurement. So basically barriers in full and equal participation. So, you know, within one year. So for six months, um, a study that looks and says, hey, what's going on in your agencies? And then in one year, um, something that says, all right, here's a plan for addressing barriers that, uh, that exist that prevent people from getting full and equal participation. So now that we kind of have an idea of what this, what this executive order attempts to do or is saying it's going to do, what you got? Um, I mean, I still don't like it. You know, right. it, okay. a lot of the a lot of the words are just um, are very vague. Uh, full and equal participation. What, what are we What are we defining? Especially to how many agencies is this? Uh, uh, you're looking at. I mean, they're probably in the double digits. Mm -hmm. um, once again, you get you go back to it when you when you start with an executive order and it's 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 vague and exclusionary. Um, I, I'm not really sure what the hopes that I would have for such a, a, a revisit of 
looking at how they distribute federal funds and, mm-hmm. and barriers. I mean, I would always hope they would find all the actual barriers that do exist. The war on drugs and all kinds of things, but right. you know, they're, they're not going to go into that. Um, I, I'm just, I'm not a fan of it. Gotcha. You know, it's, it's, it's just a bad order. Okay. And, uh, and, and I, I can understand that. I mean, if it starts off on a bad foot in your mind, like saying, hey, we're going to identify all these particular groups, then the rest of the order may not be salvageable. It's very possible. Now, um, especially to specifically with this, you know, we're talking about um, what type of underserved are we talking about here? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about um, infrastructure? Are we talking right. about healthcare? I mean, well, I think they're looking at uh, all these different federal agencies and saying, like, look, which that's what I'm saying, which is we're everything to one of them. And we're um, going to look and see what, what we find and what constitutes a barrier. Right. And especially when it doesn't define that. Now, and you got to think about that, especially when you're conflating equality and equity mm-hmm. is. And I, I mentioned this because have you seen the. Um, uh I think it was called the baby. I don't know what baby bill. They were talking about Cory Booker was the one that was presenting it where they were going to start putting a thousand dollars into a savings account. Oh for, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard about that. Okay. Well, how I grew up, I wouldn't have been um, eligible for that. Uh, mm-hmm. We were not. We were not rich whatsoever. And I think they figured out that it would be like forty-two thousand uh, mm-hmm. dollars when you're eighteen. Life changing uh, wouldn't wouldn't suffice right uh, of an explanation of what that would have been for me and i would have been uneligible for it you know to me it's it's an attack it's a class warfare attack and uh whenever i see uh barriers listed in an executive order we're going to attack these barriers and we're including the word equity i i want to know what barriers these are um if you know Sorry, I stepped off screen. Oh, no, you're fine. You know, I'm concerned. Once again, we move further in executive order, even if the initial uh, definition, this included everybody, but didn't define what barriers are. um, I would still be concerned. Like, what kind of barriers are we talking about here? Um, You know, according to the executive order, the way that it's written, um, nobody has any barriers, but uh, excuse me, everybody has barriers, but Caucasian Christians. So now are we are we going to designate barriers as being something other than your individual capacity? Uh, is is skin now going skin color or uh, religion or any of these other things? Are these going to be now permanent legal barriers that we're going to say, okay, you, you can't jump over this because you're um, I, I, I don't like I don't like it. I, you know, I, I don't like the direction. Um, but like I said, it's a fact finding and that's the other thing too. It's, it's all based upon some subjective measure. There was an identified problem. Somebody didn't come up and say, Hey, look, we're having a problem specifically with this. Uh, none of these agencies came to the federal government and said, we need to have a fact finding mission. Um, like I said, it just goes into the pile with all Biden's other executive orders where it's fact finding, fact finding. And they're trying to attack some sort of um, aspect that will foster division. That's just my opinion. I got you. Sorry about that, folks. I um, have something going on here and had to uh, had, had to check on something. While hey, man, it's talking. Liberty Dad. What, you know. Well, yeah. mine, was, uh, mine was a little bit different. I had, uh, I've got multiple monitors and a couple laptops here and different things going on. So I had to. Uh, don't worry, I'm not like engaging in a Facebook debate or anything like that. Um, just uh, <laughs> check, checking on some work stuff here. Oh, you're good, buddy. Uh, so, here's my—I uh, I think here's my problem with the with the issue is that um, in you know in the last episode we you know we we did point out that you know this the executive order in the last episode was proposed to study and see if these issues existed, yeah. and this one appears to do the same thing. And it starts off by saying, "Hey, there's an issue that exists," but then let's produce a study to find out, you know, kind of if it exists because it does say it says that the um, um, it says, in partnership with the heads of agencies, study methods for assessing whether agency policies and actions create or exacerbate barriers. So, so it's already saying, like, hey, you just need to study because and see if they're going to be created or if not. Um, and uh, 
uh, you know, and so it's unclear that there actually is a barrier that needs to be addressed. And I think the biggest problem that I have with this is that President Biden has held numerous offers, offices in his political career since 1973. He's uh, he served as a U.S. senator, the vice president. He's been on multiple Senate committees. And this, is have, this has occurred over 47 years. And so this leads me to my question of how is it in 47 years of political office in positions that have given him ample view of the federal government's actions? How is it that this executive order has to create groups and order studies to see if systemic barriers exist for members in of the various underserved communities? Um, you know, like how is it that he doesn't know this already? Josh, I mean, think about this. Um, I've been in companies before where I'm relatively a new guy and I get in and I start getting situated with the with the lay of the land, if you will. And I've been able to identify where areas of improvement were necessary. Um, this has especially been the case for anywhere that I've worked or participated in for any length of time. Yeah. And I've met many other people that could do the same thing. So it's not like I've got some great wisdom of being able to go in and just magically see things that need to improve. Um, and, and, and I know other people have too, so this is very common. So again, the question is like, how is it in 47 years? He doesn't have a specific area to tackle and say, look, I'm going to make an executive order because in the last 47 years, last five years, last 10 years, he could say, hey, while I was the vice president for eight years, here's what I saw. And for whatever reason, um, you know, I was not able to address it. Um, and now that I'm president, I'm going to put that as, an, you know, that's, I want to address this one particular area that I know can be changed. And so I feel like this is, uh, this, this executive order is again, like you said, a fact finding mission, because it suggests that there's a problem, but then tells us it needs to study and find out if there is going to be yeah. a problem. And it's going to take six months, possibly a year before we have that answer. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and, and that, then you just have an answer. It's like a recommendation. And then you haven't actually said, all right, now we're going to put it into play. Yeah. There's going to be actionable yeah. items off of this. Right. Of some and nature. so, so the only, the only measure of success that I can see is that they propose a plan in six months or a year. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. That's not impressive. I can propose a plan all day long. That doesn't make it a good one. And yeah. it doesn't mean that I've necessarily benefited from it. They may pro propose a, a really great plan but not have a um, uh, not have a great timeline for when they're going to accomplish it. So maybe the maybe the plan well, goes to hell. Obviously, we got a lot of opinions on this. What I view them as doing, and we've seen this in the past, is they're creating an executive order for a fact finding mission. Right. Okay. So they got a timetable on it. More than likely, whatever is going to be produced from this is mm -hmm. already being worked on previously. Right. This is this is what's called uh, retrograde evidence of need. So they're going to have something written out. There's going to be some probably uh, legislation or, or bill or another follow up executive order that's going to be prepped to be released six months, a year from now in stages that will use the evidence that is collected from these studies. So, so that's right. this is a long game plan. This is this is building into something because you and I can sit here and say like, they're not doing a fact finding mission. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're probably going to collect some, but for whatever reason compelled the Biden administration to issue these executive orders, there's a reason behind it. This right. is part of an agenda. Now that's, that's objective. That's not a, right. this is, this is how politics works. Right. Uh, you know, and you said, you know, without going into it too much, why, why did, you know, Biden's been in office for 47 years. But politics aside, um, how many times, like objectively, has this man flipped and changed positions and moved all over the right. political spectrum? I mean, right. objective truth, right? I mean, right. Th this is the man who wrote the uh, the crime bill. Okay, right. Uh, he had a hand in the Patriot Act, and you know, so we talk about. Oh, what's his intention? Well, he hasn't had the same principles, the same belief structure his whole career. Or maybe he has, and maybe he's just an opportunist. I, I don't know. That's for other pundits to decide. Right. But the way I see this, I don't see this as being some sort of crusade for equality. 
uh, that President Biden is doing. It's it's maybe at worst virtue signaling, mm-hmm. uh, maybe at best uh, just and this is what I kind of think it is. It's an appeasement to uh, a voter blocks uh, to show that, hey, look, I'm doing something right when when really nothing's changing. Right. And that all stems from having quality conversations like you and I are, are, are trying to do on here. Right. Where we we get to the meaning behind what is it we're trying to do? Do do we want equal health care for everybody? Do we want right. people to be treated underneath the eyes of the law equally as human beings? Right. If we can agree on that base principle and move from there, we'd be better off. Instead, we're, we're looking at it. We're attacking it from a different angle. And from right. my point of view, it's it's all political. And people are going to get hurt um, because it just fosters more division, you know, especially when you got a president who's not he's been in for 47 years. He's had all these different positions. He's he's hold held different policy positions. And uh, all of a sudden now here in 21, after so many years in office, I'm not going to believe he's being altruistic all of a sudden. Right. And, you know, I I, I think I think the big takeaway here. Um, Because we're, you know, we're again, um, way over our time, but that's okay. I think the big takeaway here is that this bill says in six months, uh, I'm going to produce a report. In one year, I'm going to produce a plan. And that's one year from the day that it was signed, which let's see, let's take a look at that date. Um, It looks like it was January 25th, if I got that right. Um, January 20th. I'm sorry. So January 20th. So January 20th of 2022. In uh, by that day, by that day, he, in his hand, in President Biden's hand, he's supposed to have a proposal, an idea of okay, this is how we're going to uh, resolve this underserved, this issue of underserved people with the federal government. And mind you, this is with the federal government. So this isn't anywhere else. This isn't your state. This isn't your local. This isn't with you and the job or anywhere else where you believe that equity is lacking. And it doesn't matter whether I agree with whether or not someone thinks that there's a lack of equity somewhere. It simply is only addressing the federal government. Um, so, yeah, yep. so people should ask themselves a couple of questions. They should say, okay, how often do I feel like the federal government is screwing me over? And, and, and I mean, as a individual underserved, like where do I feel specifically that the government is dropping, the, the federal government is dropping the ball on my community that I happen to be in? And the second one is, if they're, if they're, not, if they're not required to have a plan for one year, that plan doesn't get implemented till sometime after one year, however long that is. And then you have time for that plan to go into effect and then have the effects that people can say, oh, this is the result that I got. So how long will that be? And then will you actually remember it? Will people remember in one year that, you know, in two years that a plan took a year to to get put together and then um, maybe was implemented? And then what was the outcome of it? I don't think so. I think voters have a very, very short memory. And this is great to say, look, hey, I just did this thing, right? You know, you know, the president can say, look, I've got this uh, executive yeah. order and it's going to advance racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government because we've not been doing that. Maybe you haven't. Yeah. But, but I think I think those communities that are specifically identified in here need to take a hot, long, hard look and say, what am I actually getting out of this and when? And how will I know that this actually produced some meaningful results, not just a study? Because you know what? I would bet a lot of money that if we went and randomly chose uh, anybody from any of these communities that was identified and we said, how could the government better serve you? I bet you they have an answer. And if they have an answer and they haven't been working in government for 47 years, why doesn't the president have one? Good question. Good question. So, all right. Question. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up uh, uh, with that. So, you know, again, I want to say one final quick word here. If we're going to support any mandate from government officials, it should only be that which has a very, very clear purpose, sound and supporting action and measurable goals that we can judge the merits of later. You're going to be hard pressed to find some legislation that I actually agree with, because I tend to think that most of the time, almost all the time, uh, that it's really not the the job of the government, particularly the federal government, in in, uh, in way more cases than like say the state or the local. 
Yeah. Um, and then the executive uh, order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. It, it doesn't really seem to accomplish this. It doesn't, I don't see anything that says that um, we are, uh, that this is how we are going to uh, actually produce some results. So yeah, uh, that's what I've got. Um, Josh, do you have any final words? Nope. Appreciate you having me on today. It's a good conversation as always. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, I want to say thanks everybody for watching this episode. It's a little bit long. We are looking to trim it down just a little bit, but no worries. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button and to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media where the weekly episode of Just Me airs on Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join me and Josh Fields, should probably say Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion style episode of the same topic. And while you're out there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Finally, remember this, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week, catch you next time, and we are out.